thank Pekka. It's time for the Clash Royale League in North America. Today, the regular season ends. And for 6th ranked CLG and 7th ranked NRG, this is their last stand. They will be heading to the playoffs, but they can be the champion of the day. That's something. Fight for honor, my friends. Late in the season, both of these squads have been part of disrupting playoff hopes. CLG just took down Cloud9, keeping them out of the top two, and Energy putting TSM on the bubble. Both squads here looking to go out with a bang. It's been a long road to make it here. Nine weeks of Clash Royale League action. There have been ups and downs, close finishes and smashing defeats. And here we are, the final two matches in North America. Absolutely. As we hop into the standings, really not one that has a place on those top four. However, very interesting for Counter Logic Gaming if it weren't for those season sweeps to Solo Mid and Tribe Gaming. They would actually still be in contention, but no more. Sixth for CLG, seventh for NRG. Very excited about what's coming out today. And we are going to see some playoff potential action later in the day. Our current picture stands like this. Cloud9 and Tribe Gaming might meet in the first round. The winner of that might take on Immortals. And the winner of that might take on Complexity. Yes. But our match we'll get into in a moment here for the later part of the day might change things on that, word, word, on that journey to the World Finals. Yes, the World Finals in Tokyo, Japan on December 1st. Remember, if you're watching here in the States, it will actually take place on November 30th, around 7 p.m. Pacific time. Later today, we have a big one. Immortals facing off against Tribe. If Immortals wins, they take over the number one spot, get those first two rounds for buy. If Tribe wins, Tribe pushes TSM out of the fourth spot. But if Tribe loses, TSM will slide in for a rematch of the two big head-to-head -head goes they've had against Cloud9 this season. Absolutely. And today, coming out for energy is... Chief J, Hazard, our good friend Carter, and of course, Guanic rounding out that fourth man, and CLG, their opponents. No surprise here, Skills, Geo, Laddie, and Backstab X. Again, as Andrew mentioned earlier, CLG really right there. A win today will put them at 7-7, seven and seven, which would have been a playoff contending position yeah. if not for two sweeps following the Tribe and to TSM. But still, finishing at 50% would be a nice feather in their cap. To see how he feels about this match today, let's go to Gio, who's standing by with Christy St. John. Thanks, guys. Gio, let's talk about 2v2. It's one of the less practiced format coming into the league, so a lot of players have had to learn what the difficulties, what the challenges are, and the best way to overcome them. So can you tell me a little bit about that? 2v2 is really interesting. Um, a lot of people say that it's no skill, um, but I think there's a lot of skill into it, and you need a lot of communication with your partner because oh, it's like literally just one mistake or, or two, and, and the game, it's for them if you do that, so yeah, definitely. Now for this match against NRG, tell me, what are you playing for, just for fun? Are you playing to go out with a bang? We're just playing for going to have a result at the end of the season, 7-7, seven, seven. Mm -hmm. so that's going to be really good for us if, you, if we do. Unfortunately, they didn't make playoffs. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that we could have done better, but uh, I'm just proud of uh, my team and how we did this season, and uh, we're just going to play our game. All right, well, thanks so much for talking to me. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. We'll head into the war rooms in just a moment, but first we have three of our friends in their own glass boxes. Yes, absolutely. We got the baby dragon, the mini P.E.K.K.A., the princess. Of course, there's also the hog rider and the giant that you can get online at shop.supercell.com. Not quite yet, though. Those will all be available November 7th. Available right now, though, is some more Clash Royale League Coming up, we have Energy facing off against Counter Logic Gaming. So to hear how they prepare for this final match, let's take a listen inside those war rooms. All right, guys. Last game of the season. Are you guys prepared? Yep. You sure? Yes. Gio, how much does Fireball and Zap do? Damage. <laughs> 257. 257, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Skills, how much does Royal Giant do? Uh, 254. You sure about that? I'm 254. Backstab, sure. Lightning. 307. <laughs> Laddie, how many wins does Energy have right now? Three, maybe? <laughs> exactly. All right. <laughs> we beat them once, okay? So people are going to say we're lucky, but we beat them twice. They're going to respect us, all right? CLG on three. Let them hear us, okay? One, two, three. CLG! 
<laughs> Maybe the last game of the season, but it's not over. Let's go out with a little style. Let's go off with the W. You know what I'm talking about? I want to win. I want to see Chief J Let's go. up there doing backflips. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Busby? Yeah? Keep up the good work, dog. Thanks, man. Carter? We shake over here. <laughs> no today, <laughs> today, guys, let's go out hard, go out playing strong. We know the bands. Guys, let's go on. Let's just get loose. Let's get crazy and wild, all right? Yeah. On through energy. One, two, three, energy! energy! Woo! How about goblin gangs of 10, skeleton armies of 30, quadruple golemites, and half a dozen rascals? That's right, double everything in the 2v2. Geo and Skills, Hazard and Chief J, bring it on! I think our arena is plenty full with these four competitors, King. 2v2 on its way, Counter Logic Gaming facing off one more time against NRG. Yeah, Skills and Geo coming out for CLG. Not a big surprise here. We've actually seen them a handful of times doing pretty well in their 2v2 sets. Their opponents, however, Chief J and Hazard, have only shown up together three times in that 2v2 set, and their record is 3 0, Rich. Energy has performed very well in 2v2, and how will they perform today with these card bands active for all potential three games? It's going to be the Pekka, oh no, sorry, Tornado and Lava Hound. I was going to say, oh my gosh, we're going to change it up a little bit, but we are not. We're going to stick to the tried and true Lava Hound and NATO ban, keeping them out of play. I'm curious to see if we'll see some very interesting decks. Very possible. Of course, CLG would love that 7-7, seven and seven. put a stamp on the season here against Energy. Yeah, let's go. As we hop into the action, Energy's Hazard and Chief J at the top of your screen, CLG's Skills and Geo at the bottom. Andrew, you mentioned the 2v2 connection between Hazard and Chief J. Overall, throughout the entire season, they have only lost four sets in 2v2 as a team. Wow, yeah, so that just shows kind of their head-to-head -head struggles uh, for energy, which is, you know, a bit different than most teams here. Most teams here have had more success in head-to-head -head play and struggled in the 2v2. Uh, so maybe for energy, they just needed this first season to kind of get ready, get their feet wet, hoping to bounce back in season two. You know, having a good grasp on that 2v2 set puts you in a really big advantage. Yeah, overall, they, you know, that's, we've talked about 2v2 being sort of the key to success here, but really their Achilles heel, as you said, has been head-to-head -head overall. Yeah. The 1v1 set, they've only picked up three of those out of 13 the entire season, and King of the Hill has really been kind of a challenge losing six King of the Hill battles out of eight. Yeah, so you talk about winning nine 2v2 sets, losing those 1v1s, and then all the things coming down to King of the Hill. So maybe in the offseason for Energy, they've got to come around and kind of find that home run hitter that you look for in every sport, on every team. You know, a lot of teams here in the NA and over in the EU have their 1v1 all-star. Energy maybe just need to find theirs. Well, of course, the other thing has been the, the very close losses. There's no team that, I, I bet you if you go did the actual math, not a single team in either NA or EU who has lost as many games by as close a margin as Energy. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and, and what I was saying, and missed Fireball there on the Magic Archer, I wasn't trying to take away from the caliber of play on Energy, and that was my mistake if I did, because they are very, very talented players. And I agree, they have had some of the worst luck of any teams in both regions. Now, talking about CLG's season overall, it really has been up and down, winning their first two, losing their next four, getting back in the win column against Cloud9. But the ones that you mentioned really stand out, and this is important here, two losses to TSM, two losses to Tribe, and two losses to Immortals. So talking about the squads that are in that contention for the playoffs, standing in our way are those two two of those squads that swept them. Yeah, and, and that's you know that's one of the reasons why they are where they are and CLGs where they are at. Very interesting if you actually look at the season record of CLG, you recognize there is, there's almost like a pattern or an algorithm behind it. They never really get past 50%, really. They'll win three, lose three, win one, lose one, win two, lose two. It's just kind of the struggles they've had throughout the entire season, kind of bouncing back and forth, and now finally looking to even up their season to closing it out at seven and seven. And this would be a big one because they would then finish their season on a nice three-match win streak, which would certainly feel good, give them a lot of confidence going into 
into their future endeavors in Clash Royale and potentially their spot in Season 2. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows what what like uh, your end of season record has to do with recruiting, this being the inaugural season of CRL. But you know that has to come into the minds of those athletes out there looking to make their name in this world. In sudden death overtime, about 17 seconds have passed and starting to get pretty close on both sides. And you might see one of these squads start to get spells down with more pace. And right oh, yeah, now it seems CLG. like that's CLG. Uh -huh. that, that snowball coming in, the poison just in time. You saw the quick acknowledgement from Energy realizing, oh wow, once that cannon goes down, we've got nothing to defend. And CLG taking that game, a pretty close game one. So nice work from Geo and Skills taking that victory. You can see here the finish, just cycling it out with spells at the end. Both squads pretty evenly matched the whole way through, but it came down to rhythm and the drums were beating for Counter Logic Gaming. Yeah, that Mega Minion somehow, it seems like it stayed alive forever, tanking forever, just allowed that Lumberjack beneath it to run around and kind of wreak havoc on energy side, their defensive buildings and units. So uh, a great little turn of events there for CLG in game number one. So Energy trying to get one back. Last time they met, it was Counter Logic Gaming with the full four game sweep. Energy wants to write a different story today. Right, Hazard really has found kind of a home here in 2v2 with a full on record of nine and three in 2v2 sets. Part of his co contributing to, he has one of the highest win totals in all of CRL North America at 26 games. Yeah, I mean, really, really impressive for Hazard. He's done a good job in King of the Hill as well, showing up there about 13 times. Um, he's just such a talented player. So again, that's why I'm talking about their roster. Maybe just need to find out or eat it out. Maybe just a little one spot, maybe, who knows. Maybe they just need to practice, another year of practice. Well, one challenge talking about Hazard in particular is a lot of the players here uh, are already finished with high school or some of them are taking the semester off. Hazard chose not to. Balancing CRL with his high school studies, studying remotely for the entire season, so to stay on pace with the semester, and so you got to think that that's also quite a heavy burden he's been carrying throughout the season. Yeah, you got to really admire the dedication and tenacity there of Hazard doing that at his age. I mean, you and I having a few years on him know how difficult <laughs> it is to uh, kind of uproot your entire life. And then after watching these athletes and what they've done this season, it's exhausting. The amount of practice and strategy and scrimming and meetings and analysis that they have. And then imagine going and doing your math homework afterwards. Yeah, very impressive young man is Hazard. Are all four of the guys playing here today? Of course, Chief J moving from that coach position into part-time player midway through the season. And then, and then you have Geo and Skills on the other side who have really acquitted themselves well. Just a couple of missteps here and there, keeping their squad, of course, out of playoff contention. Yeah. Very, very close for CLG, as you mentioned. You know, those two season splits, that's really all it was. And this match would have a, such a bigger meaning had that changed. And both of these guys, for skills, have some pretty big signature moments over the course of the season. You have that really fantastic four-game battle between Geo and Vulcan, which he followed up by sweeping Adrian Piedra. So Geo's done some nice work this season, but don't forget about the silent assassin skills as well. Uh, he's done great. I mean, he's been here a lot in 2v2, but in particular, had a couple of big moments in King of the Hill himself. Yeah, and then you talk about backstep with their team coming out and having that really, really big moment with kind of reintroducing the new graveyard meta and, and establishing himself as one of the best Baby Dragon graveyard tornado players in the game. Most specifically for skills in terms of King of the Hill was after taking the 2v2 set over C McHugh and Wings in match number 13. We talked about them kind of getting in the way of playoff hopes. King of the Hill clutch versus Baron in that five game King of the Hill set. Uh -oh, yeah. Huge moment that probably kept Cloud9 from getting that first round playoff by. Yeah, which is a very frustrating loss for them. And now in this, we've got about a 700 damage lead on Energy's tower here at the top. So looking to split this first set. 15 seconds passed into our sudden death overtime. So just got to keep the pressure on. This miner does not connect. A very nice pickup there with the mini Pekka. Yeah, mini Pekka's for both teams and on the desk, getting a lot of love today. Hey, mini Pekka. I'm talking about the one on my desk. He's extremely cute. 
And you know, wonder about that double snowball there. Maybe a bit of a miscommunication. Yep, and we've heard basically from every single pro. Anytime you see a double unit drop or a double spell drop, it is a lapse of communication or a lapse in communication. Yeah, they got it. And you hear, yeah, they got it. So game number two going to Hazard and Chief J. Very nice work for the two together who are still trying to preserve that perfect 2v2 set record. Yeah, never, like again, never losing a set, our, our Hazard and Chief J. CLG knocking at the door, trying to take that away from them. And now you're seeing this Royal Giant come across the river. Pekka cleans it up, but that Mega Minion trying to stop the Pekka from getting it to the tower. The Hogs come in right behind, and oh, I just, I just don't think we have enough. The spell comes down, CLG doing everything that they can. Fireball, snowball, no way, no how. It's not over yet, though. Counter Logic Gaming will have a chance to get this one back because we are going to a game number three. So even though not much on the line in terms of playoff hopes, both these squads coming out firing. And these are guys who take this competition very seriously. Absolutely, and you know neither of these guys want to lose this, lose this set, and CLG wants to even up their season record. Game number three in our opening set. And it's always interesting, Andrew, to see who chooses to play on a tablet versus playing on a phone. You can see Geo right now, the only one playing completely handheld. Everyone else playing on one of the big machines. That's very interesting. I've only played on an iPad maybe once or twice, and it feels like a foreign. It feels like I'm playing a different game. Honestly, I I personally play on a phone or a device that isn't really supported here at CRL, and it's uh, it's very interesting to see how that affects people because I know a lot of people use uh, devices that aren't. Well, you know, the playing on the tablet does give some advantages. In particular, with the bigger screen, you can be, it's a little easier to be more precise with your drops. You know, not as much fat thumbs. Yeah, the tiles are bigger. On the flip side, then using two hands, as you can see, take a look at Chief J's technique, right? His hands are behind his back. He pulls out one hand. He's playing one handed the entire time. And, you know, Hazard also very similarly using one hand to steady. So. Instead of playing the, the see, then look at Geo on the bottom right hand corner, both thumbs on the screen. So, you know, it does kind of change the mechanics of how you physically use the device. That is fascinating. It is the last match of NA in the regular season, and I, I've really never even noticed that about, because I'm so used to doing two hands all in on my phone. Uh, it almost seems like Chief J is, is like playing at a slower pace, but I mean, clearly he's not. It's very interesting uh, pointing that out. Really. Well, I, I switch back and forth between devices myself, between an iPad and an iPhone, uh, or tablet and a phone, however you want to put it. And, uh, and, and I, it, it does create a different shift in technique. You kind of think about the game differently. I'm personally a person that is always clicking. I'm always clicking with my two thumbs on the cards that I had in hand to kind of keep myself, my fingers warm, and my, uh, my wits about me. So very interesting to watch the two different styles of play playing, playing off for both teams. You know, I wonder if some of these players choose different devices when it comes to, we'll have to check that. Uh, I think they have to use the same device throughout the entire competition. But in 2v2 where you tend to drag and drop more, it does feel like a tablet makes it a little bit easier for drag and drop moments. Yeah, and also just having a bit more of screen space, allowing to see all of those units and having them not be so bunched together. I mean, we've, that's one of the things we talked about with analysts and coaches is in 2v2, it's one of those things where all of a sudden there can be three units on the board and they can get double cloned and there's 15 or 20. Nice work by that flying machine taking out its partner, so getting some good damage on the right-hand side. So now CLG both feeling and creating double lane pressure at the same time. Yep, and uh, very, very nice defense by CLG. A big push coming in here on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. You got that giant scale from about a third of its HP. And that will be a nice bomb to get rid of that cannon. So question, can we take advantage of that in this moment? Lots of elixir available for CLG, but they have to play defense right now. Yeah, the cannon and the baby dragon were taken out, which was a nice thing for CLG. And then energy actually double mega minion in the center. So you think those were a couple of small misplays from them. And now that one cannon pulling all eight piggies to the center of the map. Will they be able to mitigate the damage on the left-hand side? Great job stopping that miner. I will never think Piggies is not funny. I will never, never think it either. Thank you so much, Morton, on <laughs> SK. <laughs> and Mini P.E.K.K.A. coming down the lane. Now, Andrew, a, a big debate, you know, that uh, uh, now a Mama P.E.K.K.A., 
A big debate when building a 1v1 deck is when to choose a mini P.E.K.K.A. versus a Mama P.E.K.K.A. So what goes into that decision making? I mean, the Mini P.E.K.K.A. is one of those things where it's not really going to be a win condition like the Mama P.E.K.K.A. is. The Mini P.E.K.K.A. is really more about your greatest defensive response to those big tanky units like a giant, like a golem. It's also going to do great work against a prince and dark prince, things like that. Whereas the Mama P.E.K.K.A., you have to play a lot more patiently with because she costs so much elixir. And then in turn, once you've played her, you want to support her because if she's not supported, your opponents are very, very easy at distracting her. So for me, it's really about the minute mini P.E.K.K.A. is more of a utility card, whereas the Mama P.E.K.K.A. is going more of a win condition. And now you see CLG taking this set, winning the first, struggling in the second, bouncing back in the third. Geo and Skills doing what they do, and now Hazard and Chief J have fallen for the very first time. So one step closer to an even season for CLG and they just do such a good job of cleaning up these huge hog pushes. Yeah, I mean, you saw all the eight hogs coming in. You thought it might be a little bit too much to deal with, but the one cannon coupled with the spells that you see here again, the one cannon, the snowball, the P.E.K.K.A., all of it doing a great job. I mean, even with the Lumberjack Rage coming in, they do mitigate a good amount of that damage, obviously taking a little bit more than they want, but that 12 building elixir in those cannons, four cannons down, very, very helpful. So there we go, our first set in the books, 2v2 going to CLG. And now we head into 1v1, uh, probably uh, a player who has been so close so many times and just the balls bounce the wrong way. And Carter looking to clean up this season and end it on a bang up against a veteran who's been here in Clash Royale since the beginning in Backstab X. Get ready for the very last 1v1 battle of the CRL regular season. Whoever takes it has bragging rights for a while. Backstab X and Carter. Who will spend the off-season boasting and who will spend it bawling? Answers lie in the arena. CLG with the set in hand. Carter looking to extend things to King of the Hill one more time for his squad. Backstab X coming out in the 1v1 set. He's 3-3 three and three in games, 1-1 one one overall. Carter on the other side of it, 3-5 and five in games, 1-2 overall. Both of them having a decent amount of success in King of the Hill. Very, very excited to see these two gentlemen play for the last time today. Taking a look at our card bands for all potential three games here in 1v1, Tornado and P.E.K.K.A. Oh, so you were just looking into the future earlier when you said <laughs> Tornado and P.E.K.K.A. during our 2v2 set, Rich. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is always opens up the idea to the ground beatdown or the sky beatdown. Which one is it going to be and who's it going to go to? So the veteran against the up and coming new star, Backstab X versus Carter. Come on, Carter. Energy's Carter, top of your screen. Backstab X for CLG at the bottom. And Carter, really, again, it's one of those guys who has is such a fantastic player, just the way that the, the water went downhill, unpredictable sometimes. Yeah, really, really tough for Energy and Carter. Lots of really bad luck for their squad. However, luck is a big part of every single sport, so that being a factor, not falling in their hands, or in their favor, excuse me. And with Backstab, I, it could be that deck. I'm going to hope it's not. I, I've, I feel very strongly against that no-win condition deck here at CRL, uh, but so far we're three for three on cards. And then for Carter, there's this new bait deck that's gotten pretty popular. I, it didn't have Tombstone in it, though, I didn't think. Could be just in there to protect against the Royal Hogs. So interesting deck makeup from Carter here at this stage in the season. Flying Machine and Mega Minion meeting at the river. Both players going very slow here in the opening minute and a half. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, I feel like I'm definitely wrong with Carter's deck. It could be a, a graveyard, <laughs> I guess. A graveyard <laughs> deck. Yeah, why not? What a fascinating construction. You know, uh, Prince has kind of fallen out of favor, favor to a degree as a, as a graveyard companion as of late. But yeah, it's been uh, leaning towards the cannon cart lately these days. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying, what do you think of Rascals as a, as a part of a graveyard deck? I think it's really interesting. I mean, I understand the, 
you know, some of the strongest things about Rascals is you got that tanky boy. You can split up the three cards to push both lanes, and then the girls do so much DPS, but really not a card that, that is the best for a graveyard, but I can understand still costing the same as a cannon card or that of a prince. And then Dart Goblin as well. So a lot of fascinating choices here for Carter. Again, late stage in the season, maybe show off some creativity. Yeah, I mean, I think what Carter's going for with the Rascals, the Dark Goblin, and the Tombstone are their all poison bait aspects. And that's maybe why he assumed he wouldn't be playing his uh, his graveyard till much later in the game, opting to ideally bait out your opponent's poison early on. However, backstab running a deck that doesn't have poison in it, and then in turn being able to use your graveyard to take advantage of that poison being out of cycle. Now, this is very interesting, though, with Carter, is he doesn't have a fireball in his deck, which is really what shines against this, this Seeks no win condition deck. So now stacking up Barbarian Huts on the left hand side in that lane, but also not having great responses to Graveyard so far is Backstab. Choosing to defend the left hand side with the Hut in the back, but then goes to the right, so now it is Carter with a pretty significant lead here. Well, here's the thing is, with that deck, that, that the deck that Backstab is running, is it, and it has a hard time with just the one spell. Now, yes, it does have the Bar Barrel as well, but it, you know, the Bar Barrel doesn't have the range and the chip damage that the log offers. So once you recognize that your opponent only has the one spell, the one big spell essentially in the Fireball, it's really just about picking and making them pick and choose moments to, to have to use it to pick and, oh, well, it doesn't matter because that is a gigantic push in the left-hand side. I do not see how Carter can stop that, because that cannon card is locked on, and it's got its full shield steel still. And there we go. And so that's sort of the idea behind that deck, uh, just taking a moment where it can overwhelm and knowing when to drop those cards that do push forward. Yeah, you really need to get spell value against that deck when you're playing against a deck like that with spawning units, with cards like the Magic Archer and the Flying Machine that are very susceptible to spells. You need to find moments to get great spell value to kind of make up for that elixir that you're going to be spending to keep up with all of those barbarians. So Backstab doing a great job and not letting Carter get to his graveyard that often, especially because Backstab didn't have great answers to the graveyard. So maybe the lane switch not paying off as much as Carter would have hoped. Backstab giving some more uh, shine to that deck here in the late stages of CRL. Game number one for CLG. Game number two on its way. Yeah, Rich, in a non-mirror match situation, I believe that is only the second or maybe even the first time that that deck has come out on top. Again, I love the deck. I think it's a very strong and fun deck to play. But here at CRL against the best in the world, it hasn't really uh, shined that much. So Carter playing minor early. Now talking about different physical techniques here. Take a look at Carter in the top right window again and you're seeing using the thumb of the right hand, but the pointer finger of the left hand. That's very interesting, and I've watched Backstab stream for a long, long time. Very, very familiar with the way that he likes to hold his iPad, almost like how I hold my phone, except for the iPad is about six times the size. Well, he has big hands. And interesting, so uh, a poison will stop a balloon completely if you drop a poison on a balloon and your tower is shooting it. However, in this case, with that Lava Hound in front, just enough from Backstab to get that drop and that death damage. But Miner and Ewiz and Inferno Dragon coming down opposite direction. Too much to be distracted, or too many distractions here for the defense of Backstab X. So some nice damage for Carter as we approach the midway point of regulation. Those guards were such a wonderful response. Great positive elixir trade, taking out all three of those cards, those shields, providing such utility, great utility against the Inferno Dragon. But this is where this deck starts to falter, and we've talked about it many times. It's got the guards and the tombstone for ground responses. So once your opponent recognizes that, they can start to do things like this, where they just send one Royal Ghost and a naked three elixir. They take out your tombstone and get tower damage. That is a very bad trade for you. So wondering what Carter has planned, dropping the Mega Knight at the river. So kind of saying, hey, you don't get a chance to drop. Yep. And there we go, a big leap. So preventing the balloon from getting into play and doing a lot of damage is Carter's Mega Knight. We have seen this time and time again where we see this matchup where it's Mega Knight plus against the Lava Loon. And the ground options are just too much to keep up with. Backstab knows it because 
Look, he had such a hard time dealing with the royal ghost, and then he sends in a lava hound, and then a mega knight's dropped. What does he have then? Guards? Guards are a horrible response to the mega knight because he does splash damage. So this was an instance where the deck makeup of Carter just really put Backstab in a rough spot, and obviously the play of Carter. These poisons at the river, you might wonder why, but it's cleaned up minions twice in a row now that have been huge in keeping this tower alive. So I was going to ask you if Carter plays defense purely here or pushes opposite lane, and there's your answer, Carter. Really shoring up that right-hand side. Backstab not letting him get that second tower for free. So there we have it. Just like the first one, it's CLG taking game number one, Energy taking game number two. We are again going to a game number three. Yeah, very, very exciting two sets here. Energy against CLG, and now Carter and Backstab in their final 1v1 game. I mean, unless they draw, which would be absolutely amazing. But most likely in their final 1v1 game, trying to bring it home for their teams. And this is where you see that Mega Knight come down. What is there to stop? And I love this poison. Look at what it does to the minions that are trying to take out the Inferno Dragon. It makes it so that Inferno Dragon stays alive just long enough. We all know what's going down to the bottom of the screen, but the interesting thing is at the top. And then again, you see that poison in the middle, keeping the Inferno Dragon alive. It almost feels like he's wasting his poison value, but you realize he's getting so much more out of it by just taking out the minions. So we are all tied up in 1v1. Carter really wants to get on this stage one more time, so a victory here would do that and give his teammates some chances to show off once again. Absolutely, and our friends here at the desk are very excited. Let's go into game number three. Good luck versus Dab. <laughs> Wizard emotes OP. One thing that I think is interesting, I, I could be misreading it, but it looks like Backstab has a little bit of nerves to him, which was interesting because earlier today we saw in Donkey Kong having a lot of nerves in his 1v1 set when there's really nothing to lose or gain. But this is what you love about CRL. These guys care so much. They're so competitive. They care so much about bringing it home for their team in a match like this where there is nothing at stake, still being nervous, still having that get to you is, is just amazing. So Carter may be running back the same deck from game number one. And look at this, the Dark Goblin following up behind the Prince as a response to the Tombstone. Yeah, doing a great amount of work there. Now, we've seen this combination of the Prince and the Rascals in a very successful log bait deck that Adrian Piedra actually introduced to the league about a month ago. However, with the Mega Minion in there, probably definitely not going to be any sort of log bait. Very curious to see what he's going to be running here at the top of the screen. Another graveyard deck. So Carter really liking the concept behind that deck, and this time it's paying off a bit more. Maybe he looked at the first time he played it and said, I can play this a little bit more conservatively and get a big win. Yeah. <laughs> Backstab recognizing, yeah, that is not how I wanted that to go down. So now with all that damage on the right-hand tower, there's a couple things that come into play. Do you play the tombstone behind your tower to help clean up that graveyard? However, that leaves you very susceptible to the barbarian barrel plus the graveyard up front or just the dark goblin coming across and getting a quick four shots in, only having two other ground responses. And there you go, seeing that combination of the Prince inside the Rascals, oh. taking Tower down very quickly on the left-hand side, so suddenly changing the entire landscape of this game is a nice play from Carter. I mean, honestly, that is one of my favorite interactions in the game. The first time we ever saw Adrian run it, my mind was blown when watching. I mean, you know, you think about getting a Prince behind the Rascal Boy, pushing him forward so that the Rascal Girls stay even farther back, having two tanks in front of them instead of one, just such a powerful card. Those girls might take just just a half a second longer to get started than they used to, but once they get shooting, they do a ton of damage. And this Dark Goblin playing the left-hand lane cleans up a Mega Minion, a Minion, the, the uh, Balloon, and gets a few shots off on the tower, so a very solid three elixir spent in the left-hand side by Carter. Yeah, this looks like it's gonna actually be another tower down for CLG. Ah, okay, maybe not. Maybe Carter's gonna defend well enough. With 20 seconds, though, it does look like, or excuse me, backstab's gonna defend well enough. It does look like Carter is gonna take this 1v1 set in three. So, oh, there it is. Right tower's falling, but it's probably gonna be too little too late. Take a look at backstab's king tower and right princess tower. It's going to be just a couple of, and now he can get poison value on all three unless he wants to save that defensively. He does have to be careful though, there's a lot coming down that left hand lane. And he goes in for the poison, this balloon is completely unguarded, and there is the point. <laughs> so you can see, 
<laughs> it was almost like I was doing voiceover for Carter there. He gives the same sigh of relief, <laughs> knowing that that could have gone very wrong. Well, because we've all been on the other side of that, where you decide to go for a mad dash, and so does your opponent with the balloon, and that boom, that balloon drop and death damage just come a little sooner than your attack, and it's game over. And right here, that excellent 10 Elixir push, a very expensive push with the 5 Elixir Rascals coupled with the 5 Elixir Prince, but it costing 10 Elixir also means it's going to give you the output of 10 Elixir. So much offensive prowess, a ton of HP, and an easy, quick tower down. There you have it. Carter saying, my season is not done yet. I want one more shot to shine here at Clash Royale League. Well, Carter, you will get it. Next up, King of the Hill. Each team, three players, each player, one life. First of three takes the match victory and a big one for the pride of both these squads. Let's go inside the war rooms as they set their lineups and their card bands. All right, guys, last king of the hill of the season, all right? I'd like to announce first up is going to be Laddie. Second, Geo. TM. Three, skills. You guys have nothing to lose, so go out there and play your best. I mean, you guys got this, okay? CLG on three. One, two, three. CLG! Let's show them who we're gonna bring out. Whoa. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> we have this whole window. I, I, you know, I'm I tired agree. of this, a this little ball. bit. I agree. It's a little excessive, I'm sorry. <laughs> But you know what? You're going first. All right, dog. Hazard. I've been ready to go. Hazard. Hazard. There you go. But you know what? We're going through a little curveball to them. We're doing a little Chief J. You excited for this one? <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Chief J. I before E, except for after C. All right, that's how I remember it. <laughs> Sometimes I spell that wrong. And last but not least, Carter, the man, the sweeper. On the chimney sweeper, Carter. Chimney sweeper, that's not a nice title. Carter. <laughs> Carter. Right, All right, guys, let's bring it in. Let's get this off. W. Energy on three. One, two, three. Energy! For these teams, there is no tomorrow, no playoffs. This is it, guys. Lose and leave with the bitter taste of defeat. Win and save a victory until next season. CLG, NRG. This is your last stand. Leave it all on the battlefield in King of the Hill. Nothing will be left behind in this King of the Hill battle. And talk about no man left behind making his debut in match number 14 for CLG. It's Laddie. Absolutely, it sure is. Laddie coming out for CLG from Troy here in the United States. Uh, that's about all we know about him other than he's an off-meta player. He's been around since day one, just not on the stage. His opponent, Hazard, on the other side of it, has played in 46 games here at CRL. Just a little bit more experience on that main stage. Taking a look at the card bands active for all potential five games of our King of the Hill set, it is Tornado and the Three Musketeers. Yeah, Tornado being one of the cards talked about the most in the community right now. There is no counter to it. Three Musketeers must be something out there that they, he knows that we don't. So here we go. We have the overall debut of Laddie, the King of the Hill debut potentially of Chief J. Let's go. Game number one, Energy's Hazard, top of your screen. Laddie for CLG at the bottom. Uh, discovered at the, as a CRL qualifier, got number four in his combine and his combine attempt yeah, here in North America. And he, he is the self-proclaimed comeback kid, which we know here at CRL is a very important thing to have is a comeback strategy. Sometimes losing a tower very early on, we've seen a lot of these pros bounce back. Fairly strong win rate overall in the game at 58% across ladder and challenges. So Laddie definitely does have the ability to win and his most used card just dropped. That is the Night Witch. Yeah, and Hazard here most likely coming with a Hog Rider 2.6 deck. Most definitely now that we see these five cards coming into play, that one bat needs to get taken out as soon as possible. Very well done. Yeah, and Laddie here uh, coming with some sort of uh, Goizen deck. That is giant poison for you at home. Yeah, you usually see Night Witch coupled with the Golem, but Night Witch giant here in this case. 
That's, a, that's an interesting question, Andrew. Any idea why the Night Witch tends to go with Golem as opposed to Giant? Is it just the popularity of the Golem, or is there a better synergy there? Uh, it could just be that there's the better synergy there, being able to build up more bats. The Golem is a slower mov moving unit that you start to push in the very back. You have the luxury of either starting the Night Witch in the very back or the Golem in the back and then building the push behind it or meeting the, the Night Witch at the river with the Golem. It could just be the synergy of the movement speed and the health of the Golem allows the Bats of the Night Witch to get more damage in the long run. Still kind of applying the same idea here with the Giant. Haven't seen a ton of head-to-head -head play Whoa. from Hazard, of course. Whoa, so this is a Giant Night Witch Graveyard deck. You know, you talked about him being an off-meta player, so here you go. Y yeah, I think that's the best way to just kind of to cover the basis of my confusion. <laughs> that he's just an off-meta player, and we've got a very, very odd deck. I mean, you see the guards and the Royal Ghost aren't paired together a lot, especially when you see that Mega Minion coming in. And then you throw that fourth card in of the Night Witch, and you look at those first four cards, and you're like, is this Lava Hound? Is this Golem Beatdown? Is this going to be Bridge Man? Like, what is this? You see the Giant come out, <laughs> and then the Graveyard, and you're like, all right, I don't even know what's happening. And this makes an interesting challenge for Hazard, because the, the cannon is one of the great counters to Graveyard and a 2.6 deck, but he has to use it to deal with that giant. Yeah, and you also talk about uh, Laddie loving the guards. You know, the guards of the card with so much utility offensive and defensively with those shields, the attack speed, the amount of damage they do. A really, really nice card. So maybe Laddie's just about cards that offer huge amounts of utility. If you look, the Night Witch, the guards, the Royal Ghost are all huge in that category. He does also play a lot of uh, Royal Hogs Magic Archer on the ladder, and uh, I think he mixes Rascals in with that deck as well. You know, and here's the other thing, Rich, that we're not really acknowledging because we're just talking so much about it, is that he's actually winning with it. <laughs> That's the other thing, is this deck is actually working right now. And probably the best part about the way it's working is it's working on both lanes, whereas Hazard is kind of contained to just the right-hand side at the moment. Yeah, I mean, when you have a Hog Rider deck, that is what you have to do. So Laddie coming out with a great start to his career at CRL. You called him off meta. He definitely rang home the off meta title. Comeback kid, I don't know. He was in pretty good control that whole game. So at the moment, Laddie, one of the few undefeated players in CRL North America. We'll see if he can hold on to that record. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this push, I mean, it, it, it's kind of hard to break down because you look at it and you're like, well, all the units are doing what it's supposed to, right? The poison is cleaning up the units around the tower. The giant is tanking for the uh, the cannon. The graveyard is what is dealing the most amount of damage. Very, very interesting. Also having a lot of defensive responses. You know, the guards do a lot of damage. The night witch with the bats do a lot of damage. Just wow. Game number two. Nice debut for Laddie. A king of the hill debut here for Chief J. <laughs> Now, to be fair, Andrew Chachi and El Jefe are undefeated in sets, but they did lose a game in 2v2, so the, we have to double-check that, but I believe the only person with a bagel in the loss column right now is Laddie. How dare they lose those games. <laughs> <laughs> so Chief J, as, as Rich just said here, making his CRL head-to-head -head debut. He's 3-0, and o, or was 3-0 and o in that 2v2 set. Now 3-1. and one. Yep. Now I'm curious, this doesn't look like it's going to be, uh, let's see there, you go Royal Hogs. Chief J kind of pioneered Graveyard Freeze, we mentioned that before on the show, at CRNAO because no one else was doing it at the moment. And he kind of led the charge in how that deck we played, making it part of the meta for the very first time. Yeah, that's that's one of the, the fascinating things when you talk to the guys that have been in the game since day one. They're like, oh yeah, Lava Balloon, I created that. <laughs> <laughs> And that Royal Ghost coming through once again. Uh, you know, the Royal Ghost and the NATO are the two cards talked about in the most community of how powerful they are. And only three Elixir doing splash damage, also having a tanky amount of HP, and going in and out of visibility for your defense makes the Royal Ghost one of the best cards in the game and finds him in in so many decks. So talking about Laddie's uh, off-meta credentials here, take a look, Andrew, at this Lava Miner deck with some very interesting other pieces added in. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I can That's say. That's about is, it, yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, what's the Lumberjack doing in there? The, the, in, the Inferno Dragon makes sense, because, you know, you want to be able to stop a tank if it's coming down. You know, not having any tanks or P.E.K.K.A.'s ban, you could imagine you might be coming up against a Golem. But, yeah, the, the Miner, the Lumberjack, the, the Lava Hound, I mean, it's not completely off-meta, but it is just, it is definitely something you don't see 
A little there left to center, you might say. Yeah, left to center. That's a wonderful way of putting it. That's a great poison coming down for Chief J. So left tower for Laddie down to 300, but doing some good work on the right-hand side, taking Chief J's right tower under 1,000. Laddie has 400,000 cards won in challenges, and you wonder how many of those cards are won with decks like this. Yeah. And that Royal Ghost on top of the Lumberjack there. The Royal Hawks taking the left tower there. The numbers on the Royal Ghost, interesting here, 29% use rate with a 53% win rate. So a pretty nice win rate for a card, uh, probably only effective because it is used in so many decks. And a pretty high use rate, talking about it's used so many decks. Here at CRL, 29%. There are very few troop cards that have made yeah. that kind of impact. Yeah, it's usually, uh, you'll usually always see spell cards like Log and Zap, Poison making its way up there, and then buildings like Tombstone have a very, very high use rate. But yeah, cards alone, troop units alone, not something like that at 30% almost. So we are now in Sudden Death Overtime, and Chief J does have the lead. You know, Laddie's struggling to have answers that are yeah. effective for these Royal Hogs, and here we go one more time. Yeah, and it's one of those things, to, it just as you're saying, Laddie really only has one great response in the Tombstone. Now, the Miner, excuse me, not the Miner, the Lumberjack, the Miner's what he used right there. The Lumberjack, coupled with the Tombstone, is the ideal response just because of the very high attack speed and the damage. But, yeah, not the best amount of responses for that uh, Royal Hog push. And now with his left Princess Tower down, making that Tombstone that much more susceptible to other units. And I think that Magic Archer's been on that tile for about 38 years at this point, <laughs> Andrew. It's pr shot pretty much everything that's come out of Laddie's hand. So doing its job, getting its worth, and now down to 476 is the right-hand tower of the CLG Newcomb. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and that 476 is going to be a really tough number to bounce back from when you look at the, uh, the towers of Chief J here, both above 2,000 HP. And this could be the final Royal Hog push now, getting it within spell range, and that is going to do it. So now down to 122. He does have to defend carefully here, not make any silly mistakes. But with that poison, that will be it. Welcome to Clash Royale League, laddie. Chief J saying, uh, that's enough. Yeah, hello and goodbye. And then Chief J, welcome to your head-to-head -head play. Great first showing. However, you're about to go up against a guy who has played a lot in the 1v1 sets in Geo. And now we're looking at these Royal Hog pushes, Rich. As you mentioned before, just a lot to deal with. You've got the Royal Ghost there up front tanking that Lumberjack, the Magic Archer in the back, as you said. <laughs> Chief J doing a very good job of protecting his Magic Archers. But look at this on the other side of the screen. You've got that Lava Hound pop and a lot of damage from the Miner. A great poison to kill all those pups, but damage was done. So here we go. Game number three will feature Chief J facing off against Geo. Of course, Geo has been here many times before Chief J. Only the second appearance in head-to-head -head play. Yeah, absolutely. But his first appearance was just very, very well received. So let's see what we got here in game two. Game number three underway, and Chief J barely touching his device just to send an emote really quick. You know, again, we've talked a lot about the physicality of players today, and Chief J's has been so fascinating. I, it, it really is. It, it is fascinating to watch him play. He's kind of like, oh, I'll do this, and then I'll do this, and then I'll do this. Whereas I'm like, I got to do this, and this, and this, and this when I'm playing. Very, very calm. He's got a hand over his mouth like he's contemplating. Hmm. Do I want to win? Do I looks, lose? He looks like he's shopping for a book on Amazon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> shopping for a win more like it here at CRL. And a nice start here for G on the left-hand side, but Chief J firing back. Rohawk is coming in as that tombstone is taking it down in HP. Great timing. They're going to clean up all of those units minus one Rascal Girl with that log. Almost a perfect log. So Gia with the Royal Hogs Magic Archer, Chief J running Graveyard with the Bar Barrel. Yeah, now I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of curious to maybe go home and try out that, that very popular Graveyard deck with the Rascals in place of the Cannon Cart, just to give you a little bit more uh, DPS to the skies there. And here we are seeing it again, this, full, this is the deck we've seen a couple times today, yeah. with the, uh, the Dark Goblin in behind the Prince as well sometimes, so... A fascinating deck makeup here that did take energy in the King of the Hill. 
Yeah, so many poison bait aspects, as we talked about earlier, with the tombstone, the rascals, the dark goblin. You, you figure that's a part of what this deck is about, is making your opponent use the best response to their graveyard. And Chief J content to use the poison against that magic archer because not really an effective tool for these royal hogs. Although Prince and Barb Barrel doing a good job of getting some of that taken care of. And I bet we'll see a Dark Goblin coming in here pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, you got Prince, Barb Barrel with the Tombstone. That is a very expensive, that's a 10 elixir defense, you know. So uh, Chief J has got to figure a more cost efficient way to play defense. And now all these units on the ground, not anything to tank for that royal ghost. This is a huge moment. You know, Dark Goblin was out of cycle, so I, I got picked off Ronda, or I think it was out of cycle, and now we see a Dark Goblin coming in, but might be a little bit late here. This left tower is just about down. And now the defensive capabilities of Geo's deck here against, uh, against that of Chief J, having the Tombstone, having the Poison, having the Rascals, a lot of responses with only 20 HP on that tower. You've got to feel like this was kind of locked away for Geo. If that Prince had escaped, maybe a different story, but it does not, so Geo taking the game against Chief J. So now he goes one and one yep. in his debut in King of the Hill. Geo moving his head-to-head -head record now to eight and nine. Yeah, eight and nine, very, very impressive there. And you see Chief J coming out and taking a great first victory. And then in the second game, struggling a bit with the ground responses. It's not that he didn't have them. It was just the amount of them and how to deal with them. Those Royal Hogs, such a nuisance. You said that one defense was, it actually was a very, very well-played defense, Rich, but it did cost 10 Elixir, a negative five Elixir trade. You can't keep up with that. And that's the story of game number three. Game number four about to get underway. And once again, coming in as the closer for energy, it is Carter looking to go out with a bang. Carter, a King of the Hill record of eight and six. And so many of those sixes have been razor thin. Oh, seriously, man. It, it, again, one of those things where talking to energy at the end of the season, it was actually at the end of their last match, speaking with them afterwards, they were saying how, you know, they understand where they're at. It's definitely a hard pill to swallow. And, you know, they don't actually feel that bad about where they ended up because it really did have a lot to do with luck, which again, as I've mentioned time and time again, comes up in all sports at every single level. So this time it's Geo playing Dark Goblin and Bar Barrel takes care of it very easily, saves the Magic Archer for a little bit longer and that Barbarian will get almost all the way to tower, picked up by the Prince. And we talked about cascading plays, you know, that Magic Archer staying alive to chip away at this Prince so now that the Prince won't get a shot on the Barb Hut, these are things that all matter. These are things that from the very first second of that six minutes start ticking, these plays all pile. And that's a hyper-aggressive graveyard play from Geo in this moment. Yeah, very, very aggressive from Geo. Um, I don't know if it was a cycle thing. I mean, maybe he wanted to fix his cycle early on and he saw an opportunity there, but uh, pretty surprising. Although his defense holding up, so we have Carter playing some no win condition up against Geo with this, this graveyard deck that has been very popular today. So now here's the moment where it's about Geo and the cards that he has in hand and how he can efficiently take care of the grouped, swarmed together cards of Carter. Now, I don't want to just say swarm units because it's not like a ton of two and three elixir cards, but it's about these big pushes that all of a sudden you've got four barbarians, bats, a royal ghost tucked in, a flying machine to the left, and a magic archer to the right. How do you deal with that effectively? Barb Hut back down again, so taking up a nice spot in the middle, although that's not going to really have much of an effect or a huge effect on the graveyard condition, although it might keep pressure on enough and make Geo double think when he does decide to play that great game. Yeah, and there I was just gonna say, I'm assuming it's a poison, because we haven't seen it come out yet. The poison, uh, not quite as effective against this deck as the fireball is, just because the fireball is instantaneous, and these cards and these troops move around so much. But if you can get great poison value, let's say right here, if he had it back in cycle, you know, if you're able to hit the barb hut, the tower, the magic archer, and those other two barbs, that would be a great moment to use your spell and kind of play catch up. So a second barbarian hut behind uh, the right princess tower of Carter, so now stacking up putting four regularly into that right-hand lane, clogging the roads of attack here for Geo, or more importantly, 
the modes of support for any of his graveyard pushes. Yeah, and that's where it becomes a problem. Four barbs coming down the lane at a time, Rich, is a six elixir card for free every 10 seconds. That's insane to try to keep up with. And now you look here, it's almost like Geo is, is gasping for air with his support troops. It's not the elixir, it's about like, where do I place my troops to get the most utility out of them to where he can't place a magic archer and pick away at my tower? Because that's really the majority of the damage that's been coming through so far. It's about that magic archer. And so, again, with this deck that Carter has, it's about building this big, massive push and then picking your opponent apart from a distance with your Magic Archer and your Flying Machine. The Bar Barrel has been doing great, though, for Geo so far, definitely keeping that ready to deal with the Magic Archer that's being dropped in the middle. So for both these guys, now you see the Bar Putt working in response against the Dark Goblin. So a lot of utility here from this, this card that's gotten so much value in the later stages of CRL. Yeah, one of those cards you wonder how popular it's become so quickly if there will be a uh, a slight nerf to it. But I honestly don't hear any complaints about the Bar Barrel. It's just that it's kind of worked its way into so many decks. I think people appreciate its utility. Well, it's a two-cost spell alternative. It's kind of half spell, half unit. So you get that aspect of it. And then the fact that it really does, it functions offensively for a couple of decks and defensively as a very specific counter to cards that have kind of annoying counters, right? So you think about the Magic Archer, which other than Fireball, which is not a, uh, not a great trade, it's an even trade, it's, so it counters Magic Archer. You think about Dark Goblin, which that's one of those cards where you've always kind of thought twice about using a log against a Dark Goblin because you usually want to save it for a different target. Yeah, usually the Dark Goblin is thrown in decks to make you use your log on it when it is better utilized on something like a Goblin Barrel or even, honestly, a Princess, because a Princess is going to provide more defensive utility than a Dark Goblin because of, because of its splash damage and the range. But taking out a Dark Goblin and requiring a response at the same time, so yeah. I don't know about you. I mean, we'll see. Definitely there's a lot to see. It's been very a, a short amount of time for the Bar Barrel so far, but you haven't heard a lot of complaints about it, and it does seem like it's a card that's found a pretty good spot here in the current meta. This is a big push. Yeah, I agree. And this this could be towered down. That was huge there for Geo. Wow. Yeah, that's going to be it. <laughs> Geo, I mean, I, I think I've gotten thrown off because it happened so quickly, but you heard his bench kind of celebrate. There was just nothing there. And I was kind of, you know, as you were talking, Rich, you were starting to look at it. Uh, and Carter starting to really thirst, drown for Elixir. He was at two and three Elixir, having to defend pushes coming down the right lane, nothing in the left lane. And so you saw Geo then recognizing Carter spending that Elixir, went hard with that Prince staying alive, and then the graveyard with the poison on top, nothing to respond in a very, very quick, quick coup de grace, right? Is that coup, de grace. Coup, coup, coup de grace. Coup de grace. Gross. 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 There we go. Now everyone Don't everyone pronounce the P, me. yeah. Everyone hates me. It's a silent P, everybody. Whatever. De Gross, I believe. <laughs> you know, you guys can correct us on that one more time. We'll take a look at this replay in a moment. Maybe we can back it up pretty far and get the last uh, significant portion of the game and see that sequence as it played out. But the most important part here is Geo getting his squad the win and evening things up for CLG. So here we are. Uh, and walk us through this whole sequence here, Andrew. So just kind of look and you see, you've got six elixir at the top of the screen. You drop that cannon cart, there's five down. You drop the bats, you've got one, and all of a sudden you've got this healthy Dark Goblin, a poison, a prince, and a graveyard all coming down. And this really was a cascading or compiling effect from Carter playing defense for so long. You need that spell value. You need to somehow clean up like five or six troops. I know that sounds like a lot, but legitimately five or six troops with a spell to kind of play catch up in Elixir. So there we have it. Counter Logic Gaming will finish their season at seven and seven. Just tiebreakers keeping them out of playoff contention energy one more time here in the CRL arena. And a big thanks to that whole squad. They have been fantastic to work with the entire time for all 14 matches. We really appreciate them here a lot at the team with CRL. But the victory today, of course, Counter Logic Gaming. So let's go sit down with Christy St. John, who has some words with Geo. Thanks, guys. So ending the season with that 7-7 record, taking the match, taking the 2v2, and that king of the hill. I have to ask, that last match was crazy. I thought it was going to end in a draw. How did you take it? I knew that that matchup, uh, it's really tough for me um, because he, he kept spamming uh, Barbarian Huts uh, over and over and I couldn't really poison those Barbarian Huts because then he just mm -hmm. goes um, with stuff at the bridge like Flying Machine and, uh, and stuff like that. And, and so I had to do one play which was defending the Dark Goblin 
and uh, prints at the in front of the dark goblin mm -hmm. to keep it alive. And right there, I knew that I had the game, and and so yeah. Defending troops in the back to take it. Hey man, congrats! It was a great game. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. Well played to everyone in today's match. Let's take a look at the final standings bar one match we have in, later this afternoon. Yeah, and that is a very, very big match. You look right here, Counter Logic Gaming tied with Team Solomid and pending a loss from Tribe Gaming could also be tied with them. Obviously not if they win. And then as you said before, those season splits is the reason why they won't be up there. But once again, Energy 4 and 10, CLG 7 and 7, finishing their season out at that 500 record. And now we are going to the final game of our regular season and an important game it is saved for the very last Tribe Gaming fighting for a spot in the playoffs when they are in, lose, they are out. Immortals trying to get that number one for a first and second round by Tribe Gaming versus Immortals. Let's go. Ready guys? This is what we all came to see. This one has got it all. The second ranked Immortals against fourth place Tribe Gaming. So much on the line. If Tribe wins, they're in the playoffs. If they lose, they're out. If Immortals wins, they claim the number one seed. Pretty serious business, huh guys? Let's settle it in the arena. A matchup everyone's been waiting to see. Let's not beat around the bush. On one side, it's Royal. Some say the consensus number one here at CRL. Up against the latecomer, but big winner Tommy trying to make Tribe get into our playoffs. What a way to end our regular season with so much on the line. A win today for Immortals puts them into the number one spot. A win today for Tribe clinches them that last place in the playoffs. Yeah, it couldn't come down to more than this. Tribe coming out with Oxlet, J Monty, B Rad, and the late coming superstar Tommy, their opponents, the God RF. Ah, crap, Royal, and oh yeah. Both squads have been fantastic this season. Of course, Immortals have been top of, the le uh, top of our standings before, falling back and forth, so I'm sure Complexity watching very closely, as is TSM, because Tribe could knock them out with a victory today. But the big story for Immortals, besides Royal being so fantastic in 1v1, has been the 2v2 play of Ah Crap and his partner, the God RF, and that young man getting ready for battle right now. Let's go sit down with Christy St. John, who has thoughts from the God RF. Thanks, guys. RF, a big match today for both teams. So, how are you feeling? Right now, I'm feeling pretty confident because we practice a lot. This game, we probably put the most time out of any other game, so I'm feeling good right now. Yeah, what do you think today's biggest challenge is going to be? Today's biggest challenge is probably if we go to King of the Hill, because King of the Hill is like kind of like a coin flip, you say, because it's like three of the best players versus another three good players, and it's, it's pretty tough. I have to ask, if you get first place today and you make it to the playoffs, yeah. who do you want to compete against in the final game? In the final game, what team or player? What team? I'd want to play against TSN. Why is that? Because uh, we're really good friends with them, so I think it would be really fun, and... Like the previous games, we've done really well against them, so I want to play them. Interesting. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. No love lost from God RF. I want to play and then beat my friends <laughs> yes. in the finals. Well, right now, a few of their friends coming up next. Let's go inside the war rooms as these two squads prepare to fight for their lives. Yeah, I want you guys to make sure, like, literally, right before you go into that 2v2, the only thing that should be on your mind is when we're ready to finish this game, call out your hand. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And this is actually the biggest game, but at the same time, if we lose, we're still second place, man. Mm -hmm. If we lose, we still only have to win two more times to make it to Japan. Yeah. All right, let's hold hands. Let's My hold hands. Yes, yeah, so we support. should hold hands. Yes, right. hold hands. we should hold hands. Tommy. Oh. <laughs> hey, guys. This will be the last match of regular season, but this does not end here. Let's freaking go to playoffs, guys. We got this. We got this. We did 10 hours of training. Please, don't be in vain. <laughs> no 10, no. 10 hours. Yeah, you're not understanding anything. We're cool with that. <laughs> okay, guys. Three, two, one, try win. Let's do it. Three, Three two, two, one, try win. Enough talk. Enough hype. It's time to do the deed. Let's find out who wants it more. Ah, crap. And the God RF. B 
Virad and Oxalate. 2v2 with all your hearts. 2v2 with all your soul. This is your moment. And a big Woo! moment it is, King. It is big. So much riding on the next few minutes here. And it's the standard squad for Immortals against the late pair here for Tribe. Yeah, absolutely. The God RF and Aw Crap have competed in every single 2v2 for Immortals, except for one when you saw Royal and Oh Yeah in that 2v2 set and Aw Crap in the 1v1. Since then, they have corrected their roster and found this great duo. Their opponents, Tribe Gaming, coming out of B-Rad and Oxalate. And you know what? There's not a whole lot to talk about other than let's just get down into the action. First, our banned cards available for all, or banned for all potential three games here in 2v2. And look at that one more time. It is Double Tornado. Double Tornado. I'm actually happy about it. The less cards out of play, only one card off the table for this monster matchup between these two heavyweights. So one of the best 2v2 pairs in all of CRL facing off of two of the best players in all of CRL. For all the marbles, 2v2, let's go. Talking to both of these teams like back lads, behind stage. Backstage, I believe, is what you call it in this business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking to them backstage, both of them laser focused. Not really either team worried. Both of them just knowing what they have to to do, and they're here to do it. Nerves aren't really a factor. It's just about getting the job done. Well, especially for the God RF and Aw Crap, who have really become so fantastic in 2v2, there are in fact only three players in the entire North American region with more wins in 2v2 than they have collectively. Of course, Colton and Razor together at 22 wins in the 2v2 set. And then if you look at Energy, Hazard has 21, and trailing those three players, it is the God RF and Aw Crap both standing at 19. Yeah, which is a very, very excellent resume to, to, to uh, talk about here in 2v2 and how hard it is with all these teams kind of moving around their rosters as much as they have to stick with the God RF and Aw Crap for as long as they have is one of the reasons why they're in that top two spots. You talk about complexity being the other team with that amazing win record again in that top spot. Well, the, uh, the overall Immortals has only lost five sets and 2v2. But to, put, to highlight the importance of that 2v2 set, four of the five times that they lost in 2v2, their squad went on to lose as well. The only other time uh, being when Royal picked it up and sent them the King of the Hill. Yeah, and we all know with the skills that Royal has in that head-to-head -head play that anything is on the table if you can make it to King of the Hill, but you've got to make it through those first two sets first. So early lead for Aw Crap and the God RF. Entering into double elixir time, and they really have grown to love this royal giant giant skeleton combination late in the season. Yeah, and you know, that cannon being such an excellent response to the royal hogs, having just a little bit extra HP, you see Tri putting up that flying machine very, very early, almost exactly when the cannon was played to take care of it, allowing those hogs to get to the tower and get in a bit of damage. And in turn, you see Immortals doing the same thing. That's a great spot for your flying machine, for your viewers at home, right there in the middle, picking apart your opponent's defense. And the Miner coming in, no surprise there. It's been a big part of 2v2, but of course, with Brad and Oxlade together. Brad, the, the Miner player. Miner overall in head-to-head -head play has a usage rate of 21%, with a win rate of 51%. Very very good spell cycling uh, from Immortals, never doubling down, never spending too much elixir on their defense, just adequately spending every time, very efficient play, excellent communication. And that's an important lightning because that Royal Giant will get one shot off on the tower, so now down to 531. If the God RF and Aw Crap can play good defense here on the right-hand side, they should be in a very good position to sew this thing up. And you see Tribe having to commit more Elixir than they want to that left-hand side again. I mean, Immortals honestly could have let that damage go. It would have been a lot of damage more than they were comfortable with, clearly, as they defended it. But that was the thing is, again, they've got a very, very healthy tower on the left that they can basically ignore if a counter push, a small counter push, comes down the lane. So Flying Machine looking to escape, maybe get on tower. Bats do pick it up, but that Lightning and Log put it within Fireball range, and that will be it. One more game win for Aw Crap and the God RF, moving them to 20 total and really starting to bite at the heels 
of that top pair in Colton and Razor. Yeah, you watch um, them play this 2v2 I'm set. You look at the communication thing. between them and you watch the way that the units fall and where they are and the way the spells fall and what, you know, who supports the pushes and you see that lightning coming down to support the Royal Giant. There's just so much going on between these two guys, so much communication and that is really what 2v2 is all about. And you imagine this being their 13th set together. This is why they took that game number one. So fantastic play to open up from Immortals. Tribe Gaming's B-Rad and Oxford, of course, that squad's been mixing up their 2v2 a whole lot. So hopefully they can find the rhythm here to give themselves a good spot heading into that 1v1 set and maybe take some pressure off of Tommy. There we go. All right, let's go. Let's go. Right. And you know, Rich, another thing to focus on from that last game, and I was talking about it so much, it was it was so nice to watch the God RF and Awkrap kind of use their spells almost as if it was a choreographed dance. But you look, and they spent 46 Elixir as opposed to the 24 by Tribe. 22 more Elixir on spells. That is a lot of damage. Quite a bit, and now you see Tribe working with their own lightning spell and going Royal Giant, Giant Skeleton as well. And in the bottom, we've got that cannon once again to kind of pull the Royal Hogs all together. Obviously gonna pull any tanks to the center. Royal Giant is not gonna enjoy needing it, but they've also got that golem at the bottom. Guards picking up the rest of that quite nicely. So first minute passing away and not a whole lot left, uh, not a whole lot done so far. Yeah, that was a really, really nice seven for three trade, pulling that flying machine over and picking up the lumberjack with those guards. You know, you definitely see more cannon in 2v2 uh, relative to the amount of tombstone in the opposite direction as of late in our 1v1 sets. Yeah. A lot of that being, of course, because of that HP difference. Yeah, and I was going to say, it's very interesting because at the beginning of the season, you know, we saw a lot more of the tombstone. It was, again, one of those things where people realized uh, the utility so much of the tombstone in 1v1, they were so used to using it there, the cannon not as popular. Maybe it's, again, sometimes you just kind of forget how good cards can be. Well, especially against a card like the Royal Giant, that extra 300 hit points does allow it to survive longer and act as a deeper distraction with the Royal Giant hitting at around 254. Yeah, because really in 2v2, the buildings, uh, the cheap buildings, I should say, to correct myself, are really more about distracting and pulling units than they are about providing defensive utility or damage. Obviously, the shots from the cannon and the skeletons from the tombstone providing a little bit of damage, but it's really more about distracting the tanks for longer with what have become the new tanks in this meta in the Royal Giant. A very high value fireball for immortals in that case and trying to help them get back into an elixir uh, elixir race here. But so far, the pressure of Tribe has really prevented them from mounting any offense. And you see now the Golem making its way up the right-hand side there. We have not seen many of those for this late stage in 2v2. Yeah, they're having to spend a lot more elixir defending than I think they would like to, having to you know, throw down a fireball and, or excuse me, a poison and a lightning. These are just a very expensive, expensive defenses that they're doing here. Not really allowing their offensive pushes to get as much support as they'd like and need, honestly. So now 15 seconds away from sudden death overtime and Tribe seems to be have, have control of the rhythm, but the deeper we are in double elixir time, the more opportunity for these big golem pushes to mount and create some danger. is really just kind of used as a distraction at this point to kind of tank for. And now Immortals switching up their their method and going into the madness. And this could actually pay off because now they can turn their defensive counter pushes into great offensive pushes if they can get the golem down in front of it. And now you see the most damage that Immortals have done the entire game coming in here with two minutes and 30 seconds left of overtime. Quite a big push there. Now down the 952 on the left-hand side. So that worked wonders giving Immortals a good opportunity to close out this 2v2 set without having to go to a third game. Yeah, and that double golem coming down, very, very threatening, such a menace. Now you gotta imagine they're gonna do everything they can, Immortals, to get that Inferno Dragon out of play as soon as possible. These two golems really just need one healthy one to get on the tower. Not gonna happen no, though, Andrew. Sir. Very well defended by Tribe. Yeah, very, very well defended. Now it's Immortal's turn to defend in turn. You see that lightning coming down, allowing that Royal Giant to get through, getting just one shot off. 
but could be a very important shot with only a minute 46 seconds left. And these Royal Giants, are just, I mean, they can just keep kind of rotating with the river. They've got the support behind not allowing any spell value to get on towers for Immortals. Uh, immortals are not able to get a unit and a spell down at the same, or, uh, and damage on the Princess Tower at the same time. Tribe doing a great job of keeping everything up at the river. This has been the story for a while now, with, these big skirmishes here at the bridge. Yeah, and with about 74 seconds remaining in this game, you start to wonder, do you go for the draw? Or do you, do you try to take the win? Do you, I mean, it's high risk, high reward. At this point, with only a minute left, you kind of see it's been a standstill for the most part. 520 HP. Now you feel the pressure coming on because spells and that royal giant shot become a huge, huge threat. You got to think Immortals pushes for the win here because a draw is kind of the same thing. So now wow. here we go, down to 20 HP. Can they get a spell There's around the in time? coming up. And that is going to do it. Log coming down. Immortals two up and two down. The God RF and Ah Crap one step closer. And you heard their coach talking about this two games, two games. You know, if they win today, they only need to play one more and they are in the final. Win one more and they are in the finals. Absolutely great, great 2v2 set for the God RF and Ah Crap. And Rich, this is the moment where they kind of uh, feel like, you know what, it's not working. What we're doing isn't working. We need to change things up. Let's try to go into the force. And so they go into the push that Tribe's been throwing down the entire game, and they get a ton of damage for it. And here they go, moving not only their set record to 9 and 4, so tying up with Hazard uh, as far as their 2v2 wins, but also their overall 2v2 game wins now at 21, tying Hazard. So only Colton and Razor stand in their way for the record of the regular season here in CRL. Yeah, you look there once again, Immortals spending 32 more Elixir. Say it again for the people in the back, 32 more Elixir on spells. You saw so many of them wasted at the river, but they weren't wasted. They were controlling the pace of the game, using their spells. An insane amount of Elixir spent on those spells, Rich. Very impressive. And here we go, folks. Get your popcorn. Tell everyone to be quiet. Close your door. Focus in because this is a matchup of gargantuan proportions. Let's go to 1v1. Royal facing off against Tommy. With so much at stake, no one is messing around. Immortals has Royal and Tribes got Tommy. Will the Nicaraguan ninja do his thing or will Royal steal the crown? Turn down the lights, light up the chat. The 1v1 showdown is now. This is what CRL is all about. Two players going head to head with everything on the line. Absolutely, you got Royal coming out for Immortals, as Rich said, maybe arguably the best player in the entire world Recently beating, you know, Vulcan, Carter, Frost, Geo, Adrian, Piedra, and Wings, you know, no big deal. And then on the <laughs> other side of that, you've got Tommy coming into the league three and one in 1v1 sets, two and oh in King of the Hill, and one of the biggest threats to all the head-to-head -head players we've seen. Let's take a look at the band cards active for all of our potential three games here in 1v1. And it's going to be Tornado and Lava Hound. Yep, very similar card bands to what we've seen in, you know, 2v2. Honestly, there's just something about these two cards that no one wants to see and play, and it still keeps the meta very, very exciting. So one last reminder, Royal with a chance to secure a spot for his team at number one. Tommy ascending to King of the Hill, hoping to keep his playoff hopes alive. <laughs> Tribes, Tommy, top of your screen. Immortals, Royal at the bottom. And talking about records, Andrew, Royal right now holds, or is tied for one record, holds another. He has the most set wins in 1v1 at 10. So he holds that record for the season, one that will not be broken by anybody else at this point. And is tied with Adrian Piedra for most game wins in 1v1 at 21. And a very aggressive early P.E.K.K.A. here. I think Royal is kind of hoping that that deck that Tommy is running is kind of that no win condition deck, opting to go all in early on with this P.E.K.K.A., knowing that the responses are the Royal Ghost, the Cannon Cart, and the Barb Hut. Uh, a very interesting, oh, but Tommy's actually got the Fire Spirits in, maybe to avoid any Royal Hog damage coming through. 
Well, we've talked about that with Royal before, how he will change his play style up and kind of be unpredictable, not just in deck selection, but also in how he plays these decks, aggressive versus passive. I mean, you talk about deck selection here. We've got about 11 decks written down for Tommy's 12 games. And then for Royal, we've got just a, I mean, I don't even know, maybe uh, 20 different decks here. Pretty deep deck pool for both players, so hard to game for the opponent, although Royal going a bit more traditional here. Yeah, he is a big fan of P.E.K.K.A. It's showing up in a lot of his decks. And that's one of the things about P.E.K.K.A. in the hands of Royal is he's such a patient player. We all know that the P.E.K.K.A. is the most deadly when brought out in the situations where your opponent is at their weakest, and you drop that P.E.K.K.A. getting so much defensive value, they're at an elixir deficit, and then in turn you've got this massive counter push coming down the lane. And that usually only happens when you play very, very patiently with Big Mama P.E.K.K.A. So one more record to talk about with Royal. Overall head-to-head -head game wins, he has 24, behind only one player in all of CRL North America, and that is his rival for complexity, Adrian Piedra, currently sitting at 26. So if Royal wins this set, he and Adrian will be tied at that record of 26 head-to-head -head game wins. If he wins a game here and loses, King of the Hill would give him an opportunity to steal that record. I really like this play by Royal. I mean, we'll see if it actually ends up paying off. And just a slight miss on that poison, obviously wanting it to get on the tower as well. Uh, but he continues to drop his P.E.K.K.A. up high to keep these Barbarians from getting across the river to, to stop these big downhill pushes that this deck kind of succeeds or excels with. And now going opposite lane with this push. And a big push it is, Rich. Does not get to tower. and. Looks like it will all get stopped before getting in there, but a nice dash from that bandit to take care of the Magic Archer. Yeah, very, very close situation, and a zap to just mitigate a bit of that damage from the Flying Machine. This is top tier head-to-head -head play. I mean, we're at 1961 and 21.02, and we're going into overtime. Sudden death, so now a single mistake could change everything for both these squads. One thing I have to say about that high P.E.K.K.A., and I'm sure is the reason why Royal has been doing it, and I'm also sure he's been practicing against this deck as popular as it has been, is playing that P.E.K.K.A. up high keeps it so that these barbs can never, ever cross. He can never get these big pushes, because this is where it's a problem, is when this deck gets like a bunch of units at the river, and then the Magic Archer is hidden behind all of it, piercing your tower. So choosing to pick up the Flying Machine with some tower damage using for the use of that poison. You see Tommy sacrificing a good amount of damage on that left-hand tower to try to commit to this right-hand push, and a perfect Royal Ghost from Royal. And again, another one of these strengths with this deck is now that I see, okay, my tower on the left is getting weak, I'm gonna place my bar putt offset to the left to kind of give it just a little bit of defensive support, make my opponent have to make more decisions that they don't want to. Zappy's a card we saw a lot earlier on in the season. Dropped a lot in use rate later on, but notice how Royal's adjusted to the new purpose of it. Instead of dropping behind and splitting from a distance, he's now using it as a direct counter to pick up cards as they get close to his tower. Here we go once again. Yeah, not a buff or a nerf, just kind of a change in its uh, animation, if you will. And uh, that alone basically dropped it off the face of the earth in one-to-one -one play, being in a lot of bridge spam decks at the beginning of the season. These Barbarians starting to stack up here, though, so definitely yeah. some trouble coming down Royal's way. And now you see that Poison having to come in. He's going to have to eat a bit of damage on the left-hand side it's because he has to commit to this, or the right-hand side because he has to commit to this left-hand push. It's a huge push. The P.E.K.K.A. getting swallowed up, and this is where Royal starts to get in danger. Tommy does have that bar putt behind his icon in the top right-hand side of the screen, for those of you that can't see it at home. But a lot of damage coming in. That Magic Archer is still alive, and Royal is in a lot of trouble. Just hanging on is that Magic Archer wow. and behind the cannon, so a number of good shots. We are now pretty much dead even on the left-hand side. The right-hand side pretty tight as well, but it is Tommy with 40 seconds left in a pretty good position. The question now is, does Royal make the choice to play this opening game for a draw? I mean, if I'm Royal, 
I'm stopping these pushes as best I can for the next 25 seconds because I have tried my best to chip away, but I almost lost control of the game. That is my thought process if I'm Royal. And he survived. He, he barely uh, skated by there and got out of it alive. I'm, I'm very impressed that he did. And I'm, I'm sure Tommy's kind of thinking the same thing. I bet he felt like he had it in the bag there. So game number one between these two heavyweights, these two superstars in the Clash Royale world does not disappoint. Six minutes up, six minutes down, and basically neck and neck. Both benches supporting their player. That's the level these guys play at. You know, looking at this one, no one made any super critical mistakes. They took risks, yep. but it didn't seem like anyone made any major misplays, any major openings, and that's why you see six minutes down and no one getting the victory. Yeah, I really like the way that you put that, Rich. It's not that they made mistakes, it's that they took risks. And so they both had to pay for the risks that they took by taking their towers down around 1,200 HP on either side. You know, you see, you've got to sometimes opt to eat a little bit of damage to create offensive pressure or even catch up in your defense. And so both these guys taking some risks, getting paid off a little bit, having to pay for it a little bit. What a game. So first game, a draw. Now comes game number two. And uh, I expect we might see a, a split coming up here potentially. We might be going to four. So not any uh, BMs or emotes coming out of Tommy's corner this time around. Pretty focused. I mean, these guys standing at the podiums, they, they look so laser focused. Also, pretty relaxed, which is something that you have to try to maintain is your composure. You know, with so much pressure, so much on the line, the last thing you want is your nerves to work against you. So Cannon Cart picking up the Miner, but that's an expensive pickup with the Fireball coming in to stop it right there next to the tower. Yeah, getting a little bit of tower damage in and those guards stopping all the tower damage from Royal. So now we're probably looking at a Lava Miner deck from Tommy. And then here on the ground from Royal, it'll be very interesting to see if he recognizes the ground responses early on and then picks them apart with these Royal Hogs. And choosing to go with Poison to back up those Royal Hogs. So a lot of damage here on the left-hand wow. lane. And that Mega Minion escapes. You see Tommy in the top of your screen there, not happy with that exchange. Nah, just kind of sitting back, looking over to Royal, being like, all right. All right, man, you got that one. So, first minute and 15 seconds down, and it is Royal out to an early lead. And look at this, it's Giant Poison, uh, sorry, Giant Miner. Yeah, that was actually the other thing I was gonna say is it could be a Miner, but then I was thinking it wasn't because it was a Fireball instead of a Poison. So Tommy here switching things up on us a little bit, especially once that Hunter came down, it was definitely reading more Giant. Um, Gonna be very curious how these match up. And I'm, I'm sure Tommy's happy that he's not running a bottle room because the ground responses would just be lacking. Well, those ground troops getting chewed up by that Mega Minion Inferno Dragon combination, and now a split push coming down the lane. A very healthy push coming down the lane, Rich. That Inferno Dragon is gonna take that tower. Yeah, even with that zap, this should be it on the oh. left hand side. Very, very close down to 182, but within spell range. So it's going to be a poison there at some point. Now Royal just with the option to put pressure on the right-hand lane, and now he knows where his opponent's going to be going. Absolutely. I mean, with such a crazy six-minute draw in the first game, both these guys probably getting a little bit antsy, and I think that's exactly what that was in the very beginning, Rich. A little bit antsy on that cannon cart with the fireball from Tommy, kind of leaving his defensive options or elixir. I mean, he wasn't in a deficit. They were both around seven elixir when that push started. However, you saw how it ended up paying off for Royal and how it turned out for Tommy. Probably really wishing he had that four elixir back. Being able to stop that cannon cart at the river with, I mean, any of those last three cards he has in his cycle. And a great job cleaning everything up there for those fire spirits. So Tommy giving the well played. Royal kind of giving a little bit of cheek there, putting the poison on both the Princess Tower and the King Tower. So game number two to Royal, moving his overall game record in 1v1 to 22 wins. And now his head-to-head -head record moves up to 25. And you look at the bench of Immortals and their coach and their athlete. Not one smile from all of them. They are laser-focused, knowing that one game isn't going to do it. One game is not going to clinch that number one spot. And right here, you see that first interaction. You even still see a bit of the elixir on the ground from that cannon cart disappearing in the bottom right, top left, and top right. Top left, you see the tower going down. In the top right, you see the frustration on Tommy's face. 
So here we go, game number three, and to remind you here, a win for Royal puts this thing away, but a draw or a win for Tommy sends us to a fourth game in those tiebreaker rules. Game number three, we went draw and win. A lot of Immortals logos there, a lot of that teal on the left-hand side. Tribe looking to put some red up there on the board. And just in case you weren't familiar of the stakes that Rich and I have been cramming down your throats, <laughs> Complexity loses their second or their first place position and Immortals takes it with an Immortal win today. And a Tribe win gets Tribe in the playoffs and knocks TSM out. This is just absolutely crazy. So taking their time, no one really pushing too hard early, and it is that graveyard coming down for Tommy. Doesn't like seeing a poison come out in response. A very aggressive graveyard, and now with that getting cleaned up pretty quickly, he can eat the rest of this damage and then probably opt to golem up. If that's what he's doing, but you see Night Witch, you see Mega Minion, and you see Knight, and you think Golem. However, he actually does not have an elixir advantage. A golem would not be great, although his opponent's win condition is out of cycle. Yep, so there it is. So Prince and Night Witch behind the Golem going up against this graveyard deck. And that poison is going to make it so that this Prince gets a bit of work in on that Golem. A nice play, but maybe a bit aggressive with the poison. We'll see. And, you know, if there is one Achilles heel to Tommy so far this season, it has been a bit of aggression. Maybe pushing a, a little stronger in certain situations than, you, than it might call for. Yeah, and it, it looks like it's going to actually pay off really well for him right now. Only at about a one elixir deficit. And with a healthy Electro Wizard on the board. You know, Royal has been so fantastic this season, and we haven't seen him run what he's considered the best at, which is Golem a whole lot. Yeah, and, and now you got to think he's going to start to build that next Golem push, getting in double Elixir. You see the Night Witch in the back, and so this is kind of the moment for Royal to really kind of uh, show everyone that he is a very good Golem player. He's just shied away from it because y'all knew that about him. There you see that Prince getting cleaned up, the Mega Minion doing work, the Golemite still alive, but not gonna get through to the tower once again. So Tommy's still in the lead here. And Tommy's been forced to, to shy away from his graveyard here. Now we are 20 seconds left and we're seeing the second graveyard play. So he knows the poison is there, so that's part of the problem. And he has to make sure he keeps enough Elixir to deal with these Golem pushes. Yeah, and a great job of Tommy getting that Prince to push that Ice, was, or Ice Golem just across in time to tank for that Graveyard. Just getting a little bit more damage in. Obviously nothing to write home about, but just a little bit of damage in. And now you see Tommy trying to push pressure on the left because a Prince undefended will take a tower. So will Tommy's Poison be used here to clean up? And interesting placement on the Poison, not making room for the Prince to set up a Graveyard push. Instead, using it in defense. Yeah, trying to just take, you're talking about Tommy's poison. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just trying to take out that Night Witch's bats because those bats have left alive. The Night Witch, if left alive, is such a menace, a nuisance to deal with. And those bats doing so much damage. So once again, two minutes and 30 seconds left of overtime, and we are kind of at a standstill right now. You know, it's kind of interesting to think of who has the bigger advantage in a situation like this, because on one hand, for Royal, a win is the only thing that matters, which is normally kind of how it feels. But it does allow him to maybe take some bigger risks here at the end and really push for that win in a way that Tommy doesn't necessarily want to. On the other half of it, Tommy can play for a draw and it acts the same way as a win. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point for both players, Rich. And I, and I do agree, if I'm in the position of Royal, I am going guns a-blazing, trying to get this win no matter what. Although right now it does look like he's about to take the loss. And with that Prince connecting, that is it. So, you know, I told you it felt like it was going to go to a game four. Yes, and sir. here we are, Tommy evening things up. We are going to a fourth and final game of 1v1. 
And wow, I mean, that's, there, you could not have asked for more from these two players. No, not at all. You get a draw in game one, a dominant performance by Royal in game two, a dominant performance by Tommy in game three, and of course, a lowest tower situation game four. What else would we expect here at our last day of the NA in the regular season? You see this last push coming in. Somehow the Prince is still alive. The Ice Golem's up front. The Fire Spirits don't take out the Prince, and then that Lance comes in. One HP, tick away. No more Royal. So there we have it, three games down, and we are not yet finished in the 1v1 set. Royal, one more shot to close this thing out for Immortals. Tommy looking to send this thing to King of the Hill. Let's go, Tommy. And this is it, the final game of 1v1. Somehow things will be decided in the next three to six minutes. Both these gentlemen giving each other a good luck and another, you know, one of the emojis we all love and know. And Tommy going back to potentially that no win condition deck. You know, we are in a lowest tower situation, so how do you feel about that in this type of uh, environment? You know, I actually feel okay with it. It's got so many defensive uh, aspects to it, very strong defensive cards. You got the fireball as a spell, and, and we all know that Magic Archer does a great amount of t chip damage when left undefended, so this could be actually a genius situation in using this deck. The Bandit being forced to come down with the Log as a response to that Royal Ghost, but doing a decent job taking care of that in two Bandits, or in two Barbarians. That's one thing about Royal's defense is just when you think he's about to get knocked out, he fires back and picks up moments that really seemed like they were out of his grasp. Yeah, that was that Bandit defense was, was really, really well played, stopping all those units, staying alive long enough, still getting the dash off, and, uh, and then in turn stopping the flying machine from connecting to the tower. Really, really well played by him. So 90 seconds have passed here in this fourth and final game of 1v1, and so far, Talk about lowest tower situation, Andrew. We have not seen a single hit point of damage. No, and that was actually a really nice use of his Royal Ghost and Electro Wizard to stop that cannon cart and get a little bit of damage on these barbs. And now this is where this deck starts to become threatening. And you see the immediate log coming out to try to mitigate the damage. But now we are at a 400 damage lead for Tommy. And that Barb Hut is so frustrating for this deck because it seems like it's always there. You're trying to get a Battle Ram down and across into a tower, and uh-oh, another huge Barb Hut comes down. Yep, and there's another one slowing that Mama Pekka down and still taking her swings, and the whole time she's taking those swings, she's taking damage, and you saw Royal almost with the perfect bandit placement to get her to cross the river on the Barb Hut and then in turn go to the Princess Tower, but instead those Fire Spirits taking her attention and drawing her to the right. And now this is a huge push for Tommy. That fireball was massive, cleared a lot out of the way. So now it's uh, Royal's chance to try to fire back. The Barbarian Hut does not have enough Elixir quite yet. It might get down before he can do anything. And yes, here we go. We have enough Elixir for it, so expect Tommy to get that down very, very quickly, and there we have it. Yeah, and now he's starting this P.E.K.K.A. push from the back, although it's going to meet these barbs, taking a bit of damage from that cannon cart and from the flying machine. Royal really hasn't had a great answer to the flying machine. The Zap oh. is, and the e -Wiz. Go ahead, Andrew. That bandit is on the tower, sneaking below that flying machine, almost evening things up here, Rich, at 1886 to 1473, and that e is getting two shots in. We are very, very close to a tie game once again. Got to get on that cannon cart in the left lane, though. And the oh, Royal goes just a little late there. And he has to retarget it with the log. And now Royal in a very, very rough spot. And the fireball taking care of those zappies. That's what I was saying, Andrew, is that the only responses to the uh, flying machine are the e -Wiz and the zappies, neither of which are fantastic responses, and the zappies have been easily taken care of by the fireball. Yeah, and you got to think that last spell in Royal's hand is probably the poison, although he might have put in a stronger spell like the lightning uh, because he's going for that lowest tower situation. That magic archer is going to get a lot of damage again. So if the game ended right now, Tommy would be the winner because 
he has the single lowest tower down at 1101 of Royal. So Royal needs to catch up on one of these two sides and get one of those towers down below 1101 oh, or wow. better. Oh, wow. That bandit's still alive. That's going to be game. Look oh at my that. God. That is absolutely huge. The Royal Ghost comes through, and Royal somehow steals this from Tribe Game, and they're going to the playoffs. Number one. Wow. And that's why, you know what? I'm going to say it right now. He is the best in the world at this exact moment. You know, uh, Hats off to everyone else in CRL, oh but there is no one playing the game right now like Royal, bar none. And there you have it, folks, for the regular season, setting two records that will be very hard to beat in the future. 1v1 sets with 11 wins and 1v1 games with 23. I mean, he's beaten Skills, C. McHugh, Carter, Adrian Prieja, Vulcan, Geo, Frost, Wings, <laughs> and now Tommy. What? can stop this man, who knows, Immortals number one in NA, all the way at the top, getting those first two rounds bought. You know Complexity feels that they got that taken away from them, that four game losing streak in the middle of the season, just coming back to hurt them at the end, and Immortals got a lot of celebrating to do, and honestly, so did TSM. And so tough for Tommy, you know, it really felt like he had that one in the bag oh, a few yeah. times, and that's the danger of Royal is, you know, it, they're, they're, you cannot predict how he plays. Sometimes he's in your face the entire time. Sometimes he's nice and slow. Sometimes it's just great defense and counter punches. And there you have it. We'll get into the replays here in just a minute, but all smiles and all respect for a guy who really, I don't think there's an argument right now that there is a better player in Clash Royale League. I, I, if there is, I don't know who he is. And you see this push coming down the lane and this, you, you see a bandit coming in late. When I saw that bandit coming in, I was like, oh my gosh, you think it might get stopped by the fire spirits and the royal ghost, but it's alive, Rich. And that bandit staying alive to me tells me there is too much to deal with. Even with the cleanup, the poison, the royal ghost, everything there, the log, and oh my gosh, did royal deserve that win. Tommy playing magnificently throughout that entire set, all four games, and you saw in that fourth game, it looked like he was going to take it. It looked like Royal had no chance, but then Royal knew what he had to do. He had to take the tower. It wasn't going to be a lowest tower situation. Props to you, my man. You Un deserve it. Unbelievable. Just absolutely unbelievable. And the difference between Immortals in the first couple matches of the season, oh my God. the changes they made, tightening down the hatches in between AC and RF in 2v2 and Royal in 1v1, they are amazing. So, once again, let's go sit down with the Romanian uh, our very own Dracula here sucking the blood, uh, the lifeblood out of everyone else. We're going to go to Christy St. John, who's sitting down with Royal. Thanks, guys. Royal, you are being called the best player in CRL. How's it feel? I mean, it feels great, especially because I was pretty anxious. I mean, Tommy won so many games in a row against good players, so I was expecting it to be a really hard game. And going into game four, it was basically a rematch of game one, but this time for lowest tower. How did you change your strategy at the beginning of that match? So I knew it was lowest tower, that's why I played the deck, because I can tie a lot of games and then win by HP. Uh, like, he almost had me throughout the game, especially until the last minute, and then I somehow managed to win. A great win it was. Now looking forward to the playoffs, tell me, who do you think you're going to go up against in that final game? So it's going to be C9, TSM, and um, Complexity. Mm -hmm. Like, right now, I, would f I feel like TSM is going to make it. You think so? Well, RF is on your side. Why do you think that? Because, like, they are practicing really hard, and especially with Sam here, he's, he will be able to, like, play two sets of 1v1, so that's going to matter a lot. We'll see. We'll definitely all be watching next week. Well, great win. Thanks Thank for you. talking to me. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. Just unbelievable. What a fantastic way to end the season. And Andrew, let's take a look at our final standings for North America. Absolutely. As we hop into the standings here, complexity at number, wait a minute, Immortals is taking it. 10 and 4, that is right. They take the season set, or I mean the tiebreaker over complexity is the easiest way to say it. You see Tribe Gaming there tied in a three-way tie with TSM and CLG, but losing that season sweep to Team Solo Mid, we finally got our 
playoff picture locked in, Rich? And here's what it will look like for our playoffs. Round number one will be the rematch of Cloud9 and TSM. They have already gone to King of the Hill twice. Will they do it a third time? The winner of that faces off against the number two team in North America, the very hard to beat complexity. And whoever comes out of that battle will have to go up against the extremely frightening immortals in our North American finals if they hope to make it all the way to Worlds. Absolutely, and whoever wins that final match will be coming with Rich and I to Tokyo, Japan on December 1st. Here in the States, you can watch it on November 30th, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern. Don't forget to hit subscribe to follow all of the action on our Clash Royale Esports YouTube page and ring that bell so you don't miss a minute. Go to esports.clashroyale.com to follow along with your other information. And of course, there is the Esports tab within your Clash Royale app. We'll be back Tuesday, October 23rd. We'll talk about these guys in a second. Tuesday, October 23rd uh, for our playoffs for the first round. We'll be starting off, of course, Cloud9 TSM and then followed up with the winner of that against Complexity. Man, I am just so oh my pumped gosh. for that. Almost as pumped <laughs> as these guys are to be here. Yes, absolutely. The three of them will be joining us. The other two of their friends can be found online at shop.supercell.com. Their other friends are the Giant and the Hog Rider, of course, all available on November 7th. But yeah, Rich, it's all about the playoffs. I am so excited and honestly honored to be a part of it. It's been a fantastic regular season. The postseason looks to be even better. So for Andrew Guy, I'm Rich Slayton. We will see you Tuesday, the 23rd, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, back in the arena. Wow, what a day, what an epic day, and what an epic end to an epic regular season. And of course, now the real fun begins. Next week, the playoffs are here. The top four in North America will collide with everything on the line. I'm pumped for this, guys. Who will earn their spot at the World Finals in Tokyo? Watch to find out. Subscribe to the Clash Royale eSports channel. And remember, lava hounds fly slow, but they can make it to Tokyo if they leave early enough. Like tomorrow, you'll just have to watch the playoffs in flight.